Um, before we begin, though, I do want to acknowledge that Queen's University is on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. And I do also recognize that there are complicated politics tied to land acknowledgements, especially when the individuals and institutions that propagate them were insincere or hypocritical in their commitment to reconciliation and decolonization. Uh, I think it's especially relevant this week, considering events uh, with the time of the land defenders and what's it, what's it, what's it, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, no, with so much in, uh, supporters across the country. Um, actually, earlier this week, I heard someone here at Queen's actually forego a land acknowledgement, saying that the point of territorial acknowledgements um, has been started forever. Um, however, though, I think that land acknowledgements are important because it recognizes Indigenous peoples' relationships to the land, territories, and resources. And that by not doing a land acknowledgement constitutes an erasure of Queen's University as an Indigenous space, uh, which I think is even more damaging. Um, I will now give the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Max Hammond, uh, who will introduce today's invited speaker. So, thank you, Max. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Bally. Um, he's the Cow, a Kazli Wutton, and an associate professor in the Department of History and Indigenous Studies at McMaster University. I first met Alan when I was doing my PhD at McGill University. He was hired there to teach courses at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Both of my supervisors said I should check out his class and get some advice. It was good advice. <laughs> he taught one of the most, he's become one of the most inspirational historians that I've come to know. That fall, Alan co-taught an upper year seminar with Ned Blackhawk, his book you may know, that was transformational. He introduced me to conversations and questions that are still having impact today. So I was thrilled when he agreed to become my extra. My, the internal reviewer for my dissertation. Alan's book, The Creator's Game, was published in 2018. It is the first comprehensive history from an indigenous perspective of lacrosse, or perhaps we might call it the stick and ball game. <coughs> but, and I mean no slight by this, The Creator's Game is much more than a game in which you chase the ball with a stick. As the book shows, the game is part of an interconnection of culture, politics, identity, and more remarkably, Indigenous epistemology. So Alan tells the story of lacrosse um, as a game that was appropriated by settlers and then reappropriated through Indigenous resistance. And in this respect, the book is part of what Leanne Simpson calls research in history, or an act of intellectual sovereignty to re-empower Indigenous communities. It is more than a history, it imparts a decolonizing program. While it demonstrates the persistence of the colonial legacy, one that continues to obstruct indigenous self-determination, it also holds out a vision of identity and indigenous practices and ways of knowing from across the continent. In this sense, it's also transnational. It treats the history of the U.S. and the Canadian border as a powerful imaginary line that is carefully negotiated and often a catalyst to assertions of indigenous sovereignty. Last year, I taught, I had students read it in the course I was teaching called Global Indigenous Histories, and I know I'm a number of other people that taught it as well. The book is written with humor and attitude. It won the 2019 Canada Prize and the Canada Studies Prize. It was shortlisted for the CHA History Prize and the Wilson Institute Book Prize. Indeed, Alan's book has been recognized as some of the best work in recent Canadian history. His article for the Journal of Canadian Studies, Play the, Playing the Creator's Game on God's Day, was awarded the prize the best scholarly article in Canadian Indigenous history. And he's also the co-author of an article which, is, which has one of my favorite titles, Raven Plays Ball. He's also the recipient of numerous teaching and research awards. Now at McGill, Alan was promoted to academic associate, professor, and then chair of Indigenous Studies. He was given a Fulbright Fellowship, and finally hired by McMaster University as an associate professor in the Department of History and Indigenous Studies. It's quite an achievement. And a few years ago, I also remember a talk where Alan stressed his involvement with youth lacrosse camps in the Cosby Wooden and across Canada. It was fascinating. And, he volunteered, and I know that he volunteers for Indigenous communities and youth organizations throughout the year. And it's fair to say that his engagement with Indigenous communities is core to the success of his work. I'm very pleased that he's here today to speak to us about his recent work. I know he's working, currently working on an article for the American Quarterly, the Journal of the American Studies Association, which is titled, uh, which is titled 
Indigenous Brooklyn, Haudenosaunee Nationhood, and Sovereignty on the High Steel. And I know he's also working on collaborating on a film animation on the subject, uh, which I look forward to seeing. Um, the title of his talk today is Haudenosaunee Brooklyn, no, Indigenous Brooklyn, Ironworking, and the Futurity of Indigenous Nationhood. Paul Allen? <laughs> well, that introduction was way too kind. I also threw Max a little bit of a curveball because I changed the title on <laughs> So it's, that's my fault, Max. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, and thank you very much for the land acknowledgement and um, really thinking. Lot last couple of days about Tandanega and, and the community members there, the land defenders. Um, a lot's going on at McMaster with our land defenders and Six Nations uh, here in Tandanega. I know there's a lot going on, a lot of heavy hearts, and a lot of people that are putting their bodies on the line for um, for all of our futures and our, for our futurity. So I just want to let the room know that I'm thinking of them um, and that we should be thinking of them. Hopefully, supporting them in any way we can financially uh, or elsewise. Or, uh, any way that we can. So today, um, before I begin, I'd just quickly like to say thank you to the Department of History, to Four Directions, um, to Max, and to everybody that um, is hosting me. I really appreciate it. Um, I know it takes a lot of time, everyone that set this up, it, it takes a lot of time to put these things together. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of kind of extra service duties. Um, and I really appreciate everyone coming out, especially with the weather, the way it is, um, for you to come out and to uh, to listen to this presentation. I hope you enjoy it. So today, what I'm going to be doing is weaving a story for you, examining how ironworking, this kind of seemingly niche uh, livelihood of building steel structures, and the formation of a small indigenous community in Brooklyn, New York, beginning in the 1920s, would become one of the most important developments in helping indigenous peoples assert their self-determination in the 20th century. Specifically, through an examination of Haudenosaunee iron workers and the connected multifaceted role of indigenous women's work, what I intend to do is I intend to demonstrate how this urban space and the skylines formed by indigenous iron workers served as a critical nexus in helping redefine and articulate Haudenosaunee nationhood, self-determination, and sovereignty throughout the century. So let's begin. 1,800 feet above the city streets of Manhattan, New York. Because it's here, on May 10th, 2013, that the crowning spire of the One World Trade Center was erected, marking the completion of the first of six towers planned as replacements for the buildings destroyed on September 11th, 2001. Now, atop of that tower stood the latest generation of Haudenosaunee ironworkers to follow in the footsteps of indigenous families who, for the last 150 years, have helped create some of North America's most iconic landmarks. Now, beginning in the 1880s, Haudenosaunee men, particularly from the Genyagahaga, or Mohawk Nation, entered the high steel industry, and soon ironworking became a principal source of employment for Haudenosaunee men who traveled to jobs in Montreal, New York City, Buffalo, Detroit, and other urban centers throughout northeastern, the northeastern United States and Canada. And by 1907, Men from the community of Ganawage, located just south of Montreal, became prominent and active union members in the International Association of Bridge and Structural Ironworkers locally, and would later emulate that in New York City. Now, in New York City specifically, Haudenosaunee ironworkers start appearing in the historical record in about 1912, although we know they're there earlier. And by the 1920s, Haudenosaunee families from Ganawage began relocating to downtown Brooklyn, where they established the community of Little Cognawaga, which is the anglicized name of Ganawage. Within 30 years, it's estimated that about approximately 700 Ganyagahaga Nation members alone, this is not including other Haudenosaunee or indigenous community members, relocated to Little Cognawaga and helped form this community, which would thrive until the early 1970s. Now, significantly, in the 1920s and onwards, Haudenosaunee women played an active and integral role in the formation of this community as they acted as these kind of critical intermediaries operating boarding houses, working in factories, assisting transient indigenous workers from across North America, and extending the web of Haudenosaunee nationhood in these urban spaces. So as mentioned previously, by examining the history of Little Cognawaga, 
and the skylines formed by indigenous sign workers. This paper and an associated digital uh, animation I'll be showing to you intends to demonstrate the elaborate intersection in which iron working served in redefining and articulating Haudenosaunee Nation in the 20th century. Here, in these urban spaces, articulations of Haudenosaunee nationhood were transformed through the creation of these post-industrial skylines, as well as through the connected multifaceted role of Haudenosaunee women's work, and served as active sites for the growth and flourishing of indigenous identities and nationhood. In doing so, much like the work of Coley Driscoll, I argue that urban indigenous spaces are an example of the activation of nationhoods that are numerous and multiple, where these iconic skylines most often associated with colonial modernity were and are in part the direct result of indigenous nationhood and self-determination. This is particularly significant when we consider, as Carl Thrush and Chris Anderson remind us, that indigenous peoples, despite having centuries of urban histories before colonization, were physically and conceptually removed from urban spaces that existed on their territories in the 19th and 20th centuries. These spaces were reframed as modern and juxtaposed to perceptions of Indian authenticity. As Thrush argues, he says, quote, the city as the ultimate expression of colonial modernity seems to offer little space for indigenous presence. This has been replicated in both popular culture and most academic studies, in which urban indigenous people, if they're acknowledged at all, are often portrayed as little more than the collateral damage of settler colonialism, as husks, shells, ghosts, and otherwise inauthentic manifestations of some lost past. And yet, Haudenosaunee community members were at the center of building these iconic symbols and sites of quote-unquote modernity while reformulating their own articulations of Haudenosaunee identity, kinship, and nationhood through these spaces. Similar to what Chantel Norgard has argued in the case of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee citizens enacted their nationhood and sovereignty around the axis of labor, where their indigenous livelihoods were intertwined with their sovereignty and self-determination. So from the beginning, the genesis of the Ginyagahaga Nation members entry into the ironworking industry actually owed itself to the political maneuvering on the part of the community of Ganawage. See, in 1885, the Dominion Bridge Company proposed to build a railway bridge for the Canadian Pacific Railway in Ganawage, linking the South Shore mainland to the island of Montreal. Now, in exchange for the bridge being built on their territory, Ganawage negotiated to have several community members to be employed by the company during the project. Now, as the Canadian Department of Indian Affairs would record in their annual report that year, they said, quote, the excellent stone quarries on the reserve have afforded many of the Indians lucrative employment, as has the construction of a bridge in course of erection by the Canadian Pacific Railway Company across the river from Lachine to Ganawage. The proposed construction of the railway through the reserve by the same company will likewise, doubtlessly, give them an opportunity of gaining a livelihood at their doors. Well, within a year, this prediction was realized as they not only participated in this project, but 50 men were employed as iron workers during the construction of the Sault Ste. Marie Bridge connecting Michigan to Ontario, solidifying their presence in the industry for the next century. Well, Ginyangahaga iron workers from Ganawage were quick to become prominent union members by the first decade of the 20th century, and they traveled throughout central Canada to various job sites as part of local number 87 of the iron workers union from Montreal. Now, as a result of their work in the industry in Montreal, and in Canada uh, more broadly, U.S. Steel and Bethlehem Steel, which would become known as Bethlehem Steel, uh, began recruiting indigenous iron workers to job sites in the United States, including in New York City. And it was here where they would establish an extension of their nationhood in this urban space. While located on Atlantic Avenue, in the heart of downtown Brooklyn, the presence of Local 361 of the Iron Workers Union served to attract Ginyagahaga iron workers and their families to establish themselves within a 10 block radius beginning in the 1920s. Soon, the neighborhood was dominated by the presence of Ganyagahaga iron workers and became affectionately known as Little Cognawaga and referred to as, quote, the suburb of the Indian reservation by the local press. Well, 
As Reverend David Corey noted a few years later, he said, quote, Brooklyn is the most popular center for Mohawks off the reservation and is known as the downtown of Ganawage, emphasizing the link between the two communities. While despite the industry's significant influence, the neighborhood certainly wasn't limited to iron workers. After numerous individuals established themselves in the community, indigenous women from Ganawage and other Haudenosaunee communities moved on their own accord to Brooklyn, to the Brooklyn neighborhood in search of employment in factories, as nurses, school teachers, housemaids, and significantly as boarding house owners and operators. Now the neighborhood would soon come to feature not only a series of indigenous owned boarding houses, well, we know the first one opened in approximately 1920, but several key institutions including grocery stores that increasingly catered to their local clientele by carrying a specific type of cornmeal for cornbread, the Culear Presbyterian Church, and two taverns that served as a hub for transient indigenous workers. While the arrival of community members, the Presbyterian Church quickly became one of the most important centers for residents to gather, and included not only Protestants, but also Roman Catholics and Longhouse community members. Known as the church that makes friends in Genyagaha, the presence of the Genyagaha patrons was so prominent by 1938 that the pastor, Reverend David Corey, learned Ganyagaha, the Mohawk language, and began offering monthly services in the language as well as using a translation of the Gospel of Luke. So they actually translated it into Mohawk or Ganyagaha. Furthermore, it wasn't long before community members became actively involved in the church as three women, including nurse Helen Skye and school teacher Doris Dybo, became Sunday school teachers. Michael Dybo was elected as a deacon and community members hosted widely popular community events in Brooklyn uh, known as Indian pageants to raise funds for church activities. Well, in addition to the religious training, the church placed a strong emphasis on teaching Haudenosaunee history, thanks to those Haudenosaunee community members that were active in that church, who pressured the church to do this. And it strengthened the connection between Little Cognawaga in Brooklyn and Ganawaga by establishing a relationship with the United Church back in Ganawage. As Corey would write in 1955, he said, quote, Many of the valuable lessons, both for the general field of social and economic adjustment and for the more specific church interest, may be learned from the Ganawage Brooklyn experience, a relationship existing some 15 years. A small, overpopulated reserve finds its chief economic salvation in a skilled trade that takes its men off the reserve for their livelihood, but also affords them the opportunity, the welcome opportunity, to rehabilitate the reserve itself in terms of better housing and other facilities. Two churches, one on the reserve, the other in the new urban area, have established a mutually helpful and reciprocal relationship. Perhaps Ganawage and Brooklyn have indicated in both economic and ecclesiastical terms a technique for conserving the values of the reservation and adjusting to modern life. Now, the significance here, I argue, isn't that Little Cognawaga was defined by a relationship to the church. Certainly the majority of Little Cognawaga's residents weren't active in this institution. But it does serve as one example of the significant connection linking ironworking, urban spaces, and the Ganyagahaga between New York City and Ganawage. So, well, in addition to this kind of pre the Presbyterian Church, we had two taverns uh, that also served as a critical link for the community, known as the Spar Bar on Atlantic Avenue, which was owned by a woman from Ganawage and her non-indigenous husband, as well as the Wigwam Taverns, these two institutions were a critical link for transient indigenous workers in terms of communication. For example, they were known to have one of the only telephones in the community. Uh, prospective employment and other community services. Still yet, the indigenous ownership in Brooklyn was not insignificant in that under the Federal Indian Act in Canada, it was illegal for indigenous peoples to drink, to visit a tavern, or to enter a hotel that served alcohol until 1970. So while indigenous women could own and operate these establishments in Brooklyn, they couldn't do the same in Ganawage. As former little Cognawaga resident Verlaine White remembers, she said, quote, the wigwam was a lot more than just a bar. It was like Grand Central for the Mohawk Indians who came here, she said. People sometimes picked up their mail there, 
They got rides back to the reservation there. And they found out about jobs there. This is where they all met. Well, beyond these institutions, which served as a critical link between Ganawaga and Brooklyn, one of the greatest legacies of Little Cognawaga was its central presence in the struggle to affirm the Haudenosaunee self-determination, sovereignty, and right to cross the in imposed international boundary. After all, following in the wake of several arrests of Haudenosaunee ironworkers in Little Cognawaga as illegal laborers from Canada, it was an ironworker named Paul Daibo that successfully articulated Haudenosaunee self-determination in U.S. federal court and defended indigenous people's treaty rights between 1927 and 1928 to freely cross the international border. Now, due to the introduction of the 1924 Immigration Act in the United States, which sought to limit immigration from Asia and Southern and Eastern Europe, indigenous peoples crossing the imposed international boundary were also targeted and now considered trespassers and illegal aliens. Following the immediate months of the Act's passage, the U.S. Department of Immigration began arresting transient Haudenosaunee ironworkers that had crossed the border, which was featured prominently in the New York Times. For instance, in the early summer of 1924, three Ginyagahaga ironworkers were arrested in New York City by the Bureau of Immigration, claiming that they had traveled from Ganawage illegally as strike breakers and were charged under the new uh, Immigration and Alien Labor Law and sent to Ellis Island. In response to the increasing obstruction of their sovereign border rights, several Haudenosaunee community members throughout the Confederacy, particularly Clinton and Beulah uh, Rickard from Tuscarora, just outside of Buffalo, New York, and David Hale from Six Nations of the Grand River, just outside of Toronto, mobilized to fasten the Haudenosaunee's right to freely cross the international boundary line as guaranteed in the J Treaty of 1794. Now, as Rickard stated in his autobiography, he said, quote, our people were continually stopped when trying to cross the border, despite the fact that no order had come from Washington to bar the Indians in 1924. Just to the contrary, in fact, for the letter I had received from Immigration Commissioner Hall indicated that Indians might be admitted on a temporary basis. This discrimination against our people was direct the result of race prejudice on the part of some immigration officers. They held the power, and they were using it to humiliate us. Well, over the course of 1925, the Rickards began writing letters to the Bureau of Immigration, Indian Affairs, and U.S. Senators to harness political support. And in the following year, Clinton Ricard and David Hill co-founded the Six Nations Defense League, with its main objective to, quote, redeem our border crossing right as they were before the border had become restricted, 1924. While the Six Nations Defense League was certainly, it was a new organization, it followed in the wake of an earlier sovereignty movement led by Deskaye, Levi General, and several members of the Hereditary Confederacy Council in Six Nations in the early 1920s that eventually led them to famously appear before the League of Nations in 1924. So if you don't know, one of the most famous kind of indigenous sovereignty movements, particularly out of the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, was Tuskegee in 1924. Between 1923 and 1924, and even earlier than that, Tuskegee uh, Levi General from Six Nations, representing the Confederacy Council and the Confederacy Chiefs, um, actually approached the League of Nations and went to Europe, traveling throughout Europe that year, um, basically fighting for the Haudenosaunee's sovereignty or the recognition, excuse me, the recognition uh, internationally of the Haudenosaunee sovereignty. And so this, build, this was building on a much more, uh, a well-established kind of movement that was taking place throughout the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Now as Clinton Ricard would later recount, he said, quote, For my part, I was determined not to rest until victory was won. The last words of Chief Descaye had said to me before he died were, fight for the line, meaning the border. Which, and I intend to do just that. Well, central to this movement, beyond the work of the Confederacy leadership, was the arrest of ironworker Paul Daibo and his wife, Louise Daibo, in Philadelphia in 1926. Now, the Daibos were in Philadelphia, where Paul was employed as an ironworker, but they were arrested under the violation of the Immigration Act of 1924 and actually deported back to Ganawage. In response, Paul Daibo hired a lawyer and proceeded to challenge their deportation in late 1926. 
Now, instrumental in this case were five iron workers from Ganawage living in New York City that encouraged Daibo, as historian Gerald Reed has argued, to, quote, test the application of the American immigration laws to the Haudenosaunee. With the passage of the Alien Immigration Act, many of these early iron workers considered the new immigration policies not only inconvenient, but a violation of their rights as Haudenosaunee and a threat to their very livelihood. Threatened politically and economically by the immigration controls, Reed continues, they had an obvious concern with Daibo's deportation and a clear interest in actually challenging it. So after a meeting between the six ironworkers at Peter Rice's apartment in Little Cognawaga, Daibo decided to pursue the case and the group began organizing financial support for the legal costs in the community and at home. So what we see is there's actually um, a, a massive increase in the number of activities that community members are hosting in order to raise funds in Little Cognawaga and in Ganawage to support Paul Daibo's case. Additionally, in February of 1926, Clint Ricard began corresponding with Daibo's friend and fellow Ganyagahaga iron worker James Ross further encouraging Daibo to test his case against U.S. federal law, as well as offering to supply Daibo's legal team with documents collected for the Defense League concerning Haudenosaunee border crossing rights. It was the sum of all these parts, ironworking, Little Cognawaga, Paul Daibo's arrest, the introduction of the Alien Immigration Act, as well as the legacy of Deskaihe Levi General's League of Nations appeal and the subsequent founding of the Defense League that coalesced to bear witness to one of the most important indigenous rights cases in U.S. federal history. In March of 1927, U.S. District Court Judge Oliver Dickinson ruled in favor of Daibo, upholding the Jay Treaty and stating, quote, the boundary line to establish the respective territory of the United States and of Great Britain, now Canada, was clearly not intended to and just as clearly did not affect the Indians. It made no division of their country. From the Indian viewpoint, he crossed no boundary line. For him, this does not exist. This fact, the United States has always recognized, and there is nothing in this legislation to work a change in our attitude. Of course, during this time, as Audrey Simpson reminds us, it wasn't simply that these Haudenosaunee actors were engaging in a struggle for recognition from Canada or the United States. Rather, they were articulating their sovereignty and the refusal of the exclusive and absolute sovereignty of these two nation states and their borders. They were asserting their own borders and their right to self-determination through these various spaces of political activation. Well, furthermore, following the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924, Haudenosaunee community members such as Clinton Ricard vehemently articulated that they were not going to compromise their sovereignty in exchange for U.S. citizenship in any form. Said, quote, whether it was dual citizenship or citizenship ward status, because it mounted to political integration at the expense of citizenship in their own nations. So specifically, as Kevin Bruniel argues, quote, Rickard asserted the fundamental importance of sovereignty for the Iroquois nations, the Haudenosaunee, and he did not so in a manner that acknowledged the complexities of their colonized political context. Well, certainly, Little Cognawaga and ironworking was exactly that, and part of this kind of transformative political movement to shapeshift how and where indigenous self-determination would be asserted and what it would look like in its contemporary form. Simultaneously, as members of the Confederacy were attempting to articulate their sovereignty in U.S. courts and in, in the international arena, Haudenosaunee community members were forming an extension of their neighborhood in New York City by creating the community of Little Cognawaga. And they were extending, a, uh, they were extending their nationhood through Little Cognawaga. The industry for Haudenosaunee community wasn't simply an urban cultural adaptation of individual and collective adjustment, so often portrayed in the, in the literature. Rather, ironworking, including the associated work of indigenous women in the community, and Little Cognawaga were an active and contemporary extension of Haudenosaunee nationhood and its futurity. Okay, what's futurity? Futurity is not the study simply of the future, but what, what you are planning might become. So if, for instance, 
as Little Cognoaga, the argument I'm making is, as Little Cognoaga is developing and that it becomes an articulation of Haudenosaunee nationhood, it's a way in which the Haudenosaunee are considering what their nationhood is going to look like in the future. What is it going to be? How is it going to continue? So that's the study of futurity. I'm not getting too involved in that. There's, it's coming out of the, the work that I'm using. Um, it was Karen Recklack. It was coming out of U of T that's doing um, indigenous performance studies. Um, it's coming out of dance, it's coming out of theater, um, it's coming out of works on things like um, uh, water and ocean studies um, by indigenous peoples. That's where, this, uh, where I'm framing uh, my sense of this futurity. That is, the way in which the Haudenosaunee were uh, attempting to kind of continue to build their nation into the future. Urban spaces were one of those spaces that they were able to do that. It's not the only space, but certainly it's a part of it. So here, in this urban space among a diasporic community, the Haudenosaunee initiated a new articulation of their nationhood. And this is particularly poignant when we consider that the growth of Little Cognawaga came at the height of the Bureau of Indian Affairs relocation program in the Western United States. This was a policy initiated in the early 1950s and resulted in the relocation of approximately 160,000 indigenous peoples from reservations to cities such as Cleveland, west to Los Angeles. Now while the policy focused on western centers, it remains that it and the larger federal, uh, federal termination policies that followed operated under the notion and expectation that cities in North America perceived to be representative of colonial modernity and the antithesis of indigeneity could serve as laboratories of social transformation and assimilation, ultimately facilitating the termination of indigenous identities and legal rights, including treaties. And yet, in the case of the Haudenosaunee iron workers, these urban spaces facilitated the growth and flourishing of their self-determination. Ironworking, and by extension, Little Cognomaga, served to act as an example of what Gerald Visner has, and more recently Jody Bird, have theorized as the transmotion of indigenous sovereignty. So encouraged by the active movement of Haudenosaunee Nation, articulated through indigenous bodies, through indigenous stories, uh, livelihoods and kinship net networks, repositioned in Little Cognawaga, the industry and space became a vehicle to further pursue and affirm Haudenosaunee sovereignty. Now, the transmotion of Haudenosaunee Nation, that is the movement of nation through stories, that's all that means. Uh, the transmotion of Haudenosaunee Nation and sovereignty isn't new, of course. In fact, if one considers the emphasis placed on the fluidity and the flexibility in the foundational quote-unquote documents of Haudenosaunee history, by that I mean the oral histories, the creation stories, cultural protocols, the emphasis placed on the fluidity of self-determination and nationhood on an individual and collective basis is clear throughout all of those documents, and it's a constant theme. From the, travelers of, the travels of the messenger, and the founding of the Great Law of Peace, which brought the original five nations together and formed the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in approximately the 14th century, depends on who you ask, um, to the edge of the woods ceremony held in Ginyagahaga communities and in Ginyagahaga territory, the transmotion and assertion of nationhood, of kinship, of sovereignty, was and is a constant and ever-present theme. Through all of their stories, throughout all of their laws, this um, shift and transmotion, it's a constant theme. And so this point of emphasis was never without sacrifices or compromise or difficulties encountered as a result of contemporary realities. And that's clear, clear throughout these histories. In the rapid expansion of urban landscapes, not unlike the changes in the past, there was dissenting voices within the change that sought to work within colonial constructs and those that sought to reject them altogether. However, Little Cognawaga and these new indigenous livelihoods connected to ironworking simply became a contemporary extension that articulated and exemplified that transmotion of indigenous nationhood and sovereignty that existed for centuries. It was an articulation of movement of nationhood. Certainly, at times, its quote-unquote liberating and limiting factors were determined by gender. Shifts in the wage labor economy and industry and capitalism itself. But those factors did not extinguish the self-determination of nationhood that both predated and coincided with these new forms of indigenous modernity, articulated through these post-industrial skylines. As Ginyangahaga filmmaker and director of the Ganawage Culture Center, Regan Tarbell, articulated, she said, quote, Ironworking 
has been woven into the fabric of Ganyagahaga and Haudenosaunee Nation over the past 150 years. It has become part of our contemporary history of who we are, and I think it's definitely part, uh, played a role. One thing I can think of for sure is that a lot of the men used to use language on the job sites, so I think it definitely contributed, and we also brought our values into that as well. Men would bring their sons, their nephews, family, excuse me, or friends on the job with them and teach them. They would teach them to do that job, and it was all passed down, and these things become part of the fabric of family. And thus, it becomes such a family thing rooted in Ganyagahaga nationhood. So I think it played a role in rebuilding our identity. Well, it's in the context of this history that my new project, partnered with Susan Roy at the University of Waterloo and many other uh, collaborators, seeks to begin reshaping uh, the urban history of the Haudenosaunee and indigenous iron workers, and to distance the story from an over, oversimplified portrayal of a racialized, hyper-masculine labor force that is so often found in popular media accounts. It's the stories that extend beyond those captured in these iconic photographs atop of the skylines that we seek to tell. So utilizing historical methodologies inspired by the field of indigenous studies, community partnerships, as well as paying attention to visual representations of ironworking produced by Haudenosaunee artists, uh, musicians, photographers, and language speakers, we set out to create a new project to demonstrate the elaborate intersection in which the iron, um, web of ironworking and urban histories played a, in Haudenosaunee kinship, gender, and intercommunity relations while shifting their articulations of identity and nationhood. One of the ways that we thought of doing this was to create a digital animation to tell this story. So what you're about to see, and you're one of the first audiences actually to see it publicly, uh, is a five minute short, co-directed by myself and Carly Loft from Gonawage, that incorporates the artwork of Haudenosaunee artists, musicians, and language speakers to be presented in communities, posted online, and eventually for public display. The story behind the video serves as one representation of the experiences of Haudenosaunee iron workers, specifically the Ganyagahaga from uh, Ganawage. Um, it's telling a very specific story, and it's telling a story about Ganawage. Um, aside from kind of critical partnerships with community members, artists, musicians, and the Ganawage Culture Center, as, as well as Six Nations Polytechnic, who've all been a tremendous help uh, with this project, there are several kind of key theories coming out of Indigenous studies focusing on resurgence, Indigenous feminism, and nationhood that informs this work. In particular, the video seeks to act as an intellectual exercise that engages the work of Leanne Simpson and form uh, a resurgent history, something that I had talked about, uh, Max had said, in the, my previous work, and now I'm kind of extending that, this idea of building a resurgent history. That is, it's an attempt to re-empower histories that focus on the growth of the indigenous inside and craft a story that demonstrates indigenous history can and does exist on its own terms, similar to what Robert Warrior has coined as an intellectual sovereignty, something again I had talked about earlier and continue on. This idea of an intellectual sovereignty, um, from my perspective, is that um, colonial history doesn't make up the center of indigenous history, nor should it. And so we shouldn't always have to engage or be forced to engage on discussing that colonial relationship and of settler colonialism. Of course those things are, it's really important to discuss that, but I'm not interested in discussing um, nation building narratives or the nation state of Canada or the United States. I rather focus on the flourishing of the indigenous inside, as Leanne Simpson says. So this is part of that exercise, is to focus on the indigenous inside and on indigenous history as an act of intellectual sovereignty. That we can exist and our histories exist on our own terms and have their own sovereignty themselves. Um, it's kind of my concept of sovereignty. And so, in many ways, the history of these post-industrial skylines in northeastern cities are stories about indigenous kinship, identity, and nationhood that have served in the act of growth of all these aspects of indigenous life. I was in New York City a couple days ago, um, and when I see things um, like the Empire State Building, when I see things um, like the 
the world, One World Trade Center, what I see is beams of indigenous sovereignty that are holding that structure up. They, would only, they only exist because of an articulation of indigenous sovereignty. It was that fight by Daibo. It was that fight by the Haudenosaunee citizens. It's a fight by indig other indigenous iron workers to maintain their self-determination sovereignty that helped raise those buildings um, because they were actively there. And in order for them to actively get there, they had to fight for those things. They had to articulate those things. So when I see these buildings, uh, many of these iconic structures in New York City that were built by Haudenosaunee iron workers, not exclusively, but that were built by Haudenosaunee iron workers, I see beams of Haudenosaunee nation um, in those. So the music in the current version of this film, which after three, three and a half years, we just finished about a couple weeks ago. Um, and so the music in the current version is by Ganawage iron worker Don Patrick Martin, who combines traditional longhouse songs with contemporary country and classical piano. Um, we also added the artwork of Marcy Miracle from Tandanega, Martin Loft from Ganawage, and Victoria Ransom from Six Nations, who all have connections to ironworking. Um, Don Patrick Martin, as mentioned, was an ironworker. Uh, all of our artists, their family members were ironworkers, whether it was their fathers or grandfathers, um, and they still have family often that are ironworking to this day. In doing so, it's our hope to kind of con that this will contribute to a further reclamation of this history, of these spaces, and the counter the invisibility and the erasure of indigenous peoples in urban spaces. So over the course of a century, as I've attempted to introduce here today, Haudenosaunee Nation was, was reimagined through ironworking and Little Cognawaga, and became a critical identity marker tied to the nation. From the early 1920s to the 1970s, Little Cognawaga thrived as an indigenous space. Now today, the community is not as prominent as it once was, but the buildings erected as a result of the Haudenosaunee's activation of the nation and self-determination still stand, and the latest generation of ironworkers continue to walk the high steel of New York City and other North American skylines. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Before we get into the Q&A, I have um, an Easter egg for you. So if you don't know what an Easter egg is, who knows what an Easter egg is? No one? Am I the only one? Okay, so Easter eggs are in video games. And what they are is they're hidden little gems in a video game that's not actually part of the game, but you go and find them. And I actually hid one uh, in the presentation that I wanted to point out. Um, which I think is pretty interesting and pretty cool. So this video came from um, New Jersey and New York's, um, I forget what the official department is, but as you watch this video, there's actually, and I didn't realize this at first, this is actually uh, an individual, a an individual with the Mohawk flag um, here, and that's what that symbol is. Um, and I, hadn't, I didn't catch it at first, um, but later saw it. And this is at the top of the One World Trade Center in 2013 when they're um, raising the crown expire. So there is your Easter egg. And now you know what an Easter egg is. It's informative and educational all around. So, thanks. so uh, it looks like we're going to have about maybe 30 minutes for questions, uh, which is good. Uh, and I would say it's a really cool looking presentation. You have to uh, tell me how you, how you did some of that. <laughs> Very visually uh, stunning and very interesting talk as well. So thank you for that, Alex. Um, so maybe for questions, um, just raise your hand, and maybe Alan, I'll let you kind of uh, pick which questions you're gonna answer. And if you could just say who you are and kind of what you are, I guess. <laughs> Does anyone have any uh, questions? At the back. Yeah. Thanks so much. Maybe it's a really trivial question, which is just what was the decision around? in the video representing all the people without eyes. Sorry, I just didn't hear the last Without eyes. Without eyes, yeah. So that's that's coming from our artist, Saki Mortani. Um, Saki is, has worked for a long time with indigenous communities, especially out west uh, in BC. And um, that, that was just a creative decision by Saki where we, it, we wanted the individuals not to represent anyone specifically, but be kind of representative of the community. And so that was, that was a part of it because a lot of what Saki was doing was, I, um, Carly, who's incredible, uh, doing amazing work, Carly Loft, who co-directed with uh, myself, 
Um, what we ended up doing was we drew a timeline and a few little squigglies onto a napkin, and Saki took that and made this incredible animation. But uh, a lot of it is based off of photographs that either we have from archival collections, from various documentaries, especially uh, Regan Tarbell, who's such a, an important part of this. If you haven't seen Regan's uh, documentary on uh, Haudenosaunee iron workers, I highly recommend it. It works really, really well for class. Uh, it's an incre incredibly done, really well done. It's on NFB's website. Um, but we were using those photographs, um, and so we have these families, which are very personal stories, um, and we, as, as part of this film, didn't want it we want it to just be more representative um, because we know we can't get to everyone's story. So it's it as part of, let's not make it look exactly like the families that we're basing these photographs on. Um, and so I, I can take no credit for uh, the artwork because that was, that was all Saki. And then incorporating, um, you'll see like the indigenous motifs, the Haudenosaunee motifs um, in the timelines and things like that. Those are the artists that contributed their artwork and then Saki took it um, and basically I'll put it into the digital animation. I have no idea how this process works, what it looks like. <laughs> I just give it to someone amazing uh, and let them do their thing. So it's a great question. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was so fascinating. The story is compelling, and what you're doing uh, analytically with the story is also really lovely. And I guess that's where I, I and that is just too cool. Um, that's where I want to go with the. Uh, the issue of thinking, rethinking indigenous people in urban spaces, yeah. but coming at it from Brooklyn, to what, ex I guess, a two-part two question, to what extent does this community continue, yeah. or what is its legacy in Brooklyn? And relatedly, what is this part of, is this part of Brooklyn, is this understood to be known to be uh, part of Brooklyn's history, right. part of New York history, things like that? Just write that down. Okay, so the, the continuation is the easiest one to... Um, so there are still many, many Haudenosaunee ironworkers and indigenous ironworkers. So um, the presentation in the video is focusing very specifically on Ganawage and that. What's happened in, since I've started the research for this project over the last three years, it's, I still say it's, it's still very early in the writing process. I'm just going through everything. It's expanding very quickly. Because what I'm starting to discover is that because of the success of Haudenosaunee ironworkers in the industry and their union activities, that the Bureau of Indian Affairs starts backing them um, and the union starts backing them to a point that they actually create an Indian ironworkers program in Chicago in the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s. A U.S. senator introduces this. What happened, the reason why I bring this up is because then there's this massive influx of indigenous ironworkers from Navajo country, Dene, um, and from Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and Anishinaabe iron workers are coming in. We know a lot of Mo uh, Mi'kmaq iron workers from Nova Scotia are you now going to Philadelphia and places like that. Okay, so the continuation. Brooklyn itself um, has been highly gentrified, particularly this neighborhood. So what happens is, in the 19, up until 1969, there's no direct road between Ganawage and Brooklyn. There's no direct highway. So the families were relocating because it was a 12-hour drive. After 1969 and the early 1970s, that road is completed from New York City to Montreal. There's a direct highway, it cuts it in half, it takes it to about six hours. That leads to more of these families from Ganawage going back to, going back to Ganawage, or they're also spreading out into job sites elsewhere. So they're going to St. Louis, they're going to Chicago, they're going to LA a lot, Phoenix. Uh, eventually happens, and so that's part of it, to the point that there's no kind of identifiable, let's say, Little Cognomaga, uh, as a community individually. There is, however, the church is still there, and there are still elements there. So the church is still there, it's no longer a church, um, and I took a picture of it, I wish I brought it with me, but I didn't. Um, the, the church in Little Cognomaga is still there. Um, and it is now residences, it's four apartments. Um, and all of these townhomes, the homes that look like this on this street, are all multi-million dollar homes now. Um, whereas, because of that gentrification that's happened, so there aren't as many indigenous uh, people in that area. Generally now they're in New Jersey, um, or in other parts of Queens. 
Um, so I do have ironworkers that text me their, their photographs that make me really sick. I, I don't want to get on top of the buildings and look <laughs> several stories down. Um, but I have, I have friends from Guanahuaga and elsewhere, uh, Six Nations, that are still on the skyscrapers. The legacy of this, so within community memory, and particularly Guanahuaga and other Haudenosaunee communities, again, I'm focusing on one story. Um, there's a lot more to this. Uh, there's more in Six Nations, in Nakosasne, in Tandanega, of course. There are many, many more stories of this. Uh, Onondaga is another one. Um, but what's happening is the legacy for little or for Gonawage, uh, this is still very rich and alive. This history is very rich and alive. Um, to the point that people rem remember affectionately living in Little Kaganwaga. Many people have family members that either grew up in Brooklyn, were from Brooklyn, or had traveled to Brooklyn. Um, to create, we have a series, there's um, a series of indigenous doc or documentaries on this. Uh, one in particular is Regan, but then there's two, there's a, two other NFB documentaries that were established and talking about this. Um, New York Times articles are plentiful. I mean, in the, maybe around 200 that I've been able to find and collect. Um, and that's not including the Globe and Mail and other newspapers in Brooklyn and elsewhere in Long Island. Um, so very, this is very much a story um, that is alive and well within the indigenous communities. And to this day, um, popular media press like the New York Times continue to cover it. Now that's not to say it's not without its problems and I don't think of those things uncritically. The reason why National Geographic, New York Times, all of these little mail, the newspapers are taking this up, especially from the 1950s and up and to this day, is it's predicated on this idea that in, in whether they admit it or not, whether it's wittingly or unwittingly um, discussed, it's predicated on the idea that indigenous peoples are the antithesis of quote unquote modernity. Therefore, they shouldn't be able to exist in this space. So what a cool story that they exist in this space. And there's this, these human stories about them. What's their life like in, Gano, or in Brooklyn? Or what's their life like in New York City? Well, it's coming from this racist notion of uh, indigenous savagery. That's, and whether they admit it or not, uh, and they often don't admit it. But that's where I, I think, and I would argue, that uh, many, many of these stories are coming from, um, and this notion. One of the ways that I'm attempting to address this, and this is the last thing I'm saying, um, one of the ways I, in which I'm trying to address this is if we take kind of models of US or Canadian history as whether, I know they're not linear, but if you take settler colonial history's definitions of timelines and you place those onto indigenous communities, you're asking them to exist within a historical structure and a historiography that is not their own. So one of the ways I'm attempting to do this is to shift it and not talk about modernity at all. Because as soon as you enter this conversation of indigenous peoples are, are contributing to modernity, it's really problematic. Because modernity is the standard, which is non-indigenous, Eurocentric, very colonial, coming out of this idea of enlightenment. Now there's a long history there I can't get into, and I can't talk about, I can't address right now. Um, so for me, and as part of that intellectual sovereignty, I don't want to engage in that conversation at all. I don't want to make the argument that they're contributing certainly just to modern, this idea of modernity, because I have a problem with how modernity is defined to begin with. Um, that is the notion that these things are anti-indigenous spaces or the antithesis, the antithesis of, let's say, indigeneity. So, that's the continuation, the legacy, lots of going on. Um, the parts of Brooklyn, you can still go there today and see the church, which is really, really cool. Um, to, there's a little tiny plaque that just says it was a church. Um, I just know it because I have the address. The bars are no longer there, but the buildings are. Um, so one's at the, the wigwam is now a nail salon, um, and the residence above it has been taken down. Um, but if you, have, if you have the address of these places, they're still kicking around. It's really neat because they're in like a, it's a 10 block radius in Brooklyn, which is now skyscrapers, and you can go see um, these buildings still standing. So it's, 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 a, yeah, it's pretty cool. And lots of, the oral history is very much um, thriving and alive and well when it comes to community stories about the neighborhood, about ironworking, about uh, indigenous women's work, and indigenous women themselves going down there on their own accord, doing their own thing, 
um, not tied to iron work. Uh, so it's it's been yeah it's been an amazing experience up to this point. Thanks for the question. Yeah. I was wondering. question. Uh, thank you for bringing it up. Um, there's a couple things that are happening here. Interestingly enough, it didn't make it into the presentation because I'm just unraveling it now. The reason why I'm starting to discover out of union records and out of really corrupt um, bridge company records and Canadian Reserve Railway and all this stuff is what is happening is I call it an infrastructural dispossession of territory. What's happening is in the 1870s, 1880s, as bridges are being built, as um, railways are being built, they are going through indigenous territories. What I found was the Department of Indian Affairs actually started working in cahoots, and this was common at the time, not to excuse it, but was working in collaboration with certain rail companies and bridge companies mm -hmm. to help dispossess indigenous peoples of their territory. So what happened was in Ganawage, at first, what occurs is the bridge company or the, the the rail comes in and says we want to build a bridge, and the Department of Indian Affairs has to deal with that because in order to expropriate the territories, it's under federal control. So what does the Department of Indian Affairs do? It actually hired the bridge company to kind of um, reconcile whatever payment was going to be done. So the bridge company asked for the territory and asked the Department of Indian Affairs, the Department of Indian Affairs turned around and said, okay, we'll hire you to tell them what you're going to compensate them with. And so what ends up happening is Ganawage is in this really difficult fight because they're being dispossessed of their territories at this time, and there's a bunch of surveys that are going on at the exact same time to kind of cut up Ganawage's territory into individual land plots. Why am I talking about all of this? Because one of the things that they do is they're forced into um, although they're fighting for their, their rights and for their land and for job prospects, it's coming out of a place of the Department of Indian Affairs and the rail companies it, through infrastructure, dispossessing them, further dispossessing them of their territories. This also happens in Akwesasne. So in Akwesasne, at almost the exact same time, just south of where St. Regis, the island is now, um, outside of Belleville, there's a railway bridge, and I don't think it exists anymore. It was there. Um, but what ends up happening is the same thing, is that uh, the Department of Indian Affairs with, this rail, or with the rail company are attempting to build a railway bridge through the territory. Um, and there's a fight about this it's through this infrastructural dispossession of territory. At the same time, Akwesasne ends up negotiating to have its workers as a bare minimum to be on that job site. And this happens constantly. I'm seeing this over and over again. I'm trying to trace it. I saw it happen in Sault Ste. Marie as well, um, among Garden River and, and that territory, Anishinaabe territory. So there seems to be a trend um, that is pointing to this. So that's how they get involved. Is, it, is there anything to Indigenous participation actually being in there? Well, when it comes to like National Geographic and um, all the New York Times, they often will say that indigenous iron workers are there because they don't fear anything. Well, this is, right, they don't fear the heights, which is a super racist uh, notion, even if it's a, a, a positive, uh, positive stereotype. But it's not, I'm not saying it's positive, but it's a positive leaning stereotype, saying that they're good at what they do because they don't fear heights, they don't have fear. This notion that they don't have fear 
actually comes from the noble and bloodthirsty savage myth. This idea that indigenous peoples are savage, whether they're noble, like Pocahontas, or they're savage, like any Western film. And so it's coming out of there. But why are they actually participating? Because they're really, really good at negotiating labor contracts. They're really, really active very, very early on. It's, it's incredible. One of the most surprising things I saw, actually, was after the 1885. It's not within a decade. They're actively involved in unions. Now, just like, hold on for a second and think about that. This is at a time when they're being shipped, indigenous children are being shipped to residential schools. This is at a time when they're being um, cast out of industries. So you can't, for instance, um, John Lutz talks a lot about this, you can't get a fishing license, a commercial fishing license. You can't get a logging license, generally. Um, you can't participate, you're being stopped from participating in a lot of these industries. Yes, they're extractive, we can have a conversation about that and about capitalism itself, that's something I have to engage with. But all these things are taking place, and yet here in ironworking, they're kind of they're really successful as agents within that. And part of this also, at the time, in the 1920s, what ends up happening is there's a big union strike. Um, so what US Steel and Bethlehem Steel end up doing is they hate unions, they're steel companies, there's a long history of this. They actually start going around the unions and going to Ganawage and hiring people because they know they have a history of ironworking. And so what they do is end up hiring non-union ironworkers. They're also quote unquote known as scabs. Um, and so that is also taking place. So we know that there were union ironworkers um, that were supporting the union from Ganawage. And there was also ironworkers that were non-unionized being hired by US Steel and Bethlehem Steel to basically get around the union strike. When these three iron workers get arrested in New York City, this is the last thing I'll say, long-winded answer, sorry. Um, talkative today, it's cold out. Uh, <laughs> what ends up happening is these three iron workers that I mentioned in 1924, right after the Alien Immigration Act passed in 1924, they get arrested. They're actually arrested as non-union members and they're taken to Ellis Island. It's U.S. Steel, I, I believe it's U.S. Steel, it's either Bethlehem Steel or U.S. Steel, actually sends their lawyers to Ellis Island to help them get them out of there because they had hired them as non-union workers for the company during a, a strike, which is a really kind of dirty thing to do, um, and it was happening at the time, so, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. the kids, uh, a lot of the children um, from Ganawage, or from the ironworkers, are going to public schools. Um, and they're going to public schools that are not racially just, uh, well, they're not segregated like a residential school, for instance. Um, and so that's taking place. The ironworking industry is mostly Italians, from what I can see is Italians and Irish. Uh, in this neighborhood, Generally, from the stories I've heard, generally they're, they're hanging out at Irish, the Haudenosaunee iron workers are not only hanging out at their own institutions, their own places, which they're not exclusive, uh, but they're also going to Irish bars, especially in the 1970s. Um, and those community relations, they are varied and I don't have a lot of this, I haven't focused on that. It hasn't been, it's not a question that I go into a community and ask about, or not that I don't ask about it, but it's, it's not what I'm in, not where I've steered the direction of the project yet. Um, it is covered in some of the documentaries. Um, so some of the community relations, people had great, had really good times, enjoyed their being in the neighborhood. Kids would get picked on at school, so there's a variety. Um, 
where they would get picked on in school, called racist names, they would get beat up, or would get in a lot of fights. Um, there's a lot of kind of oral histories coming out of, pre-recorded oral histories coming out of the documentaries that would state, and other articles I've seen, um, stating just how tough it was to be an indigenous youth growing up in these neighborhoods um, because you would be picked on, because you, people would want to fight you, um, or cut, you know, taunt you. Others have said that they, they really enjoyed growing up in Brooklyn. Um, and so that's, that's as much, it's a very limited answer. Um, and it's not a complete answer, and I don't have that complete answer, I'll admit that. Um, and acknowledge that, I think it's important to say that. Um, so that's as much as I know. I know the unions, when I go through the records, are really controlled by, again, Italians, mostly. Um, so you see a lot of the union bosses, and a lot of local unions are heavily involved with Italian Americans, um, and then the Irish are in there. There are not many people of color in the industry at all. One of the first black iron workers that I see comes in the late 1960s. Um, there's a New York Times article and another article focusing on that individual. But again, indigenous iron workers are there in the, you know, by the 1910, 1912. I know, I've seen it as early as 1908. Um, and yet we don't have black iron workers until much, much later, uh, decades later. Um, just to give it a little bit of a dynamic of what's happening. Yeah. It's a great question. Thank you very much for, for asking. I'm sorry I can't give you a complete answer. Okay. Just, 